Before we get too much into Adaptive, your company, I'd love for you to talk about, based on your rich experience at Hugging Face, also at a company called Light On that we'll talk a lot about more later in the episode, through that experience, you have tons of experience in creating LLMs that are useful for real life and at the biggest scale that LLMs come. So I'd love for you to start off by providing us with an overview of the steps involved in creating an, an LLM like pre-training and reinforcement learning. Yeah, I am. Um, it's a very timely question as well, given that I think these steps are blending a bit these days. So take everything that I say with, with a grain of salt. There's always nuance you know, in this. But very broadly speaking, you know, the way that historically uh, large language models have been kind of approached, um, first is through a pre-training phase, which is the bulk, you know, historically of where the computer has been spent. Um, pre-training, you know, is during pre-training, we essentially collect data from all over the web, pretty much every book, every paper, pretty much nearly at, at the scale of modern pre-training, nearly every text in existence. I think it, it sounds very grandiose, but it's not far from being true. And even nowadays, images, videos, and, and all of this. Um, and essentially, the model is trained to very rossly predict, you know, the next word, predict the next token. Um, this is a step that is built to be scalable, you know, to run at like scale that are essentially everything we have ever produced on tens or hundreds of thousands of GPUs these days. Um, but pre-training is only a first step because immediately after pre-training, um, models are actually a bit unwieldy. Um, if you take really pure, pure pre-training and you try your model immediately after, it's not going to be very interactive with you. It's not going to be chatty. It's not going to answer your questions necessarily in the way that you expect. I think a, a failure mode that, that we used to see a lot immediately after pre-training is let's say I ask a model a question and instead of answering the question, the model will come up with 10 more questions that are similar. Mm. And the reason why is because in its pre-training data, this is equally likely to have like a list of questions as to have you know the answer following the, the question. Um, and this led to the development of second phase in model training, which is called post-training. Um, and the idea of post-training is to kind of, kind of like own in, sharpen the model uh, to really fit how it's going to be used, which typically means making it, you know, a good chat assistant or, or something like that. And the methods that you use during post-training um, typically differ. I mean, strictly speaking, you could do post-training in the same way you do pre-training, but with just data that is specialized, you know, maybe like just only transcripts of chats and continue doing uh, pre-training on transcripts of chats only. And you would de facto be doing a post-training toward the chat model. Uh, but very often people uh, like the big success, you know, of post-training has been the use of reinforcement learning. So essentially enabling models to learn not from an explicit demonstration of what they should be doing, which is, you know, what supervised fine tuning or what pre-training are, but instead from a feedback about how are they doing. So the model generates uh, an answer and then from a human, from another model, uh, or from many different possibilities, the model gets a feedback of like, this is good, this is bad. Uh, and just based on this positive or negative signal, the model learns to, to improve. So, so this is like the the experience that a lot of us will have had in ChatGPT, where there's like a thumbs up or yep. a thumbs down that you can click after you get a response, and that can then be used as a training data for this post training phase. Yeah, and that'd be reinforcement learning from human feedback (RLHF). Yeah, from a very like yeah, from a very very high level point of view, this is an example of the sort of data you could be leveraging uh, to power this phase of post training. I think what's really interesting is you know right now um, I'm giving a description where pre-training and post-training are very separate things. The reality is much less so these days. First, because now pre-training is very dynamic where you shift the data distribution. So, you know, you might start with like the lower quality data, the more like bulk data. And as you advance through, you know, through steps of, uh, of pre-training, you will focus more on higher quality data, maybe more code, more mathematics, more, uh, it could be, you know, many like more chat data, more, you know, like more of the higher stuff that you consider high quality. Uh, I put high quality in quotes because the definition of quality is a more other subject that we could spend hours on. Um, and post-training itself, even now, people are starting to do reinforcement learning during, you know, the pre-training step or starting at some point, you know, where they start to incorporate, mix, blend the two. Um, it used to be that post-training was a much smaller spend than pre-training. You know, most of the money used to go to, uh, uh, to pre-training and to like, you know, the millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars used to go there. Uh, but now if you look at recent papers, you know, like Kimi or even Grok4, uh, not really a paper, but more something that they mentioned, which is that they spent uh, nearly as much on post-training as pre-training. So there's massive scaling up of this post-training phase. Uh, yeah. 